Welcome to Food Travel Talk TV, a monthly talk show brought to you by the World Food Travel Association, the world's leading authority on food and beverage tourism. Food Travel Talk TV was created by and for the world's culinary travel trade. Our goal with the show is to inspire us all with ways to help us do business better. Every month, we invite industry thought leaders, opinion makers, and trendsetters to discuss important topics for our industry's benefit. My name is Eric Wolf, and I'll be your host today for our October 2021 episode number 18. This month's topic is Wine Tourism in the 2020s, and I'd like to introduce our guest, Robin Shaw, founder of Wine Tourism Australia. Hi, Eric. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Feel free to post your questions at any time in the Q&A window. We will reserve the last 20 minutes or so to answer your questions. And now I'd like to set the tone for today's episode. When we talk about food tourism, is it is implied that beverages are usually included. It is simply too long and awkward to say food and beverage tourism. But there is one beverage in particular, namely wine, that compels people to book a trip. Even more than beer, whiskey, or other beverages, wine holds a special influence over culinary travelers. And the world's wine regions tend to be in beautiful places, so it's a win-win for the traveler, right? With travelers' interests changing and many people seeking more rural adventures, not to mention climate change opening up new regions to growing grapes, could this be the decade for wine tourism to surge? Welcome, Robin. And I'm glad to be here. What an interesting uh, start to the conversation there, Eric. And as you can see in my background, there's a little, uh, a little image of uh, Mitchelton Winery in Victoria uh, with, of course, the uh, typical Aussie emblem out there in the vineyards uh, in winter. Where else in the world can you go and visit a winery and have kangaroos with you? I mean, <laughs> that's quintessential Australian experience. Definitely a point of difference, I agree. I love it. So what do you think, Robin? Is is the this the decade for wine tourism's growth? Well, Erica, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. It's not just wine that we've seen developing uh, and getting a major following. Uh, in the last few years, we're also seeing a big rise in distillery tourism uh, with the rise of, uh, of gins and gin distilleries around the country and other spirits, of course, mm -hmm. uh, as well as breweries and, and craft breweries. So to your point, uh, the beverages are also getting in on the action, which I think is fantastic. I think the difference for wine tourism is that we're talking about uh, an agricultural product. We're talking about grapes that are planted in the ground and four years later, you can potentially reap the rewards of those. Wine is something that can only be produced once a year. It uh, typically does grow in beautiful regions around the world, which have other natural assets that certainly uh, entice people to come to those regions. So I think it deservedly has its own niche area of tourism known as wine tourism. And actually, Eric, it reminds me of a conversation we had probably about a decade ago when we were, I think, I think you came out to Australia and we were, uh, I guess, looking at the concept of whether we could move from this idea of wine tourism, which in Australia was gradually being embraced to be food and wine tourism, and could we introduce the concept of culinary tourism? which uh, we were trying, I guess, to position as being that which covered all of these, these areas. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, that was a bridge too far. Culinary, as, as I'm, guess you, I'm guessing you could speak to even more than I can, has, uh, has different connotations in different markets around the right. world. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And in fact, it's uh, they call it culinary tourism in Canada, gastronomy tourism in the Mediterranean, food tourism in the US and Australia, New Zealand and India. So, you know, pick a region of the world and the, the terms change. They do. And of course, uh, you know, wine tourism and food tourism are really subsets of agritourism, which talks to the agricultural roots of the products that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about how wine tourism has been developing and how it will continue to develop. So during lockdown, consumers were concentrating on sourcing food and drink, really, that was close to home, whether it was at their local greengrocers or a local honey producer or a local beer or local wine, whatever it was. How much better financially did local wineries do due to these increased sales? Yeah, it's a really uh, interesting question, Eric. Australia has probably many people in the world realise at the moment, has been in a state of almost continuous lockdown, yeah. or various parts of Australia have been, for quite some time. 
If we go back to uh, mid-2020, when the first lockdown occurred, that was a nationwide lockdown. And I think the, the general sense was that, hey, this won't last for too long, but we understand that for businesses that are affected, it's pretty bad, it's tragic, uh, we need to support them. So from a winery perspective, and I, I did quite a number of interviews at the time, uh, from a winery perspective, they found that their loyal customers really supported them. So if they were a wine club member, they brought forward their shipment. If they were a customer that lived down the road uh, and they were allowed to go just down the road because uh, wineries at that stage were still considered an essential service for takeaway, they could go and pick up their wines and so one of the uh, initiatives that I saw happen at the time also was uh, wineries were putting together kind of like care packages. So they were putting together wine together with cheese and, and little picnic packs so that people could buy those and take them home. So initially, I think there was uh, a reasonable sense of optimism. And while, the, um, while this did not and could not replace revenue from cellar door, it certainly went a long way to keeping some of the staff employed and easing the burden, as it were. For the wineries at that stage who had good mailing lists, this was their opportunity to contact those mailing lists and reach out and create offers. Of course, uh, many across many different industries were also doing the same thing to their mailing lists. I can't tell you how many, and you probably did too, how many emails I got from random places I'd visited once in my life to uh, beg for my business, which uh, yeah, buy our food became box. quite problematic after a while. Yeah. So, uh, so there was pros and cons, I guess, with that approach as well. For those that had wine clubs, it was an opportunity to build on that loyalty as well. So aside from the fact that uh, laying off staff was a big problem in that first lockdown, most weathered the storm reasonably well. Of course, Australia also had a double whammy uh, just after that in that uh, China banned exports of wine or imports of wine and put a tariff on Australian exports of uh, over 200%. So our exports to our biggest market also dried up at exactly the same time, which was um, probably almost a bigger problem. Things opened huge, up again. Huge problem, yeah. Yeah, and then they closed down again, especially in our two most populous states, New South Wales and Victoria. And that's where the damage has really been occurring in, uh, in the last six months through almost continual lockdowns uh, in the city areas and the regional areas. And unfortunately, consumer confidence has also waned during that time. And the level of support of the wineries uh, has also dropped off because people have got bigger things to worry about, such as keeping their own jobs and, uh, and being viable. So it's been a little bit mixed here. Uh, it's interesting just looking at some of the uh, statistics that uh, Wine Australia released on the 7th of October. Each year in Australia, we do a direct consumer and cellar door survey. And uh, one of the stats is that D2C sales grew overall by 17% in value and 14% in volume uh, in 2020 versus 2019. So that does demonstrate that there was an uptick in the direct sales side of the business during that time. That's fantastic. I mean, that's that. Mm. I mean, well, it's it's good news. It's a lot better than some people might have anticipated. It is, and uh, I know from looking at some of the uh, U.S. statistics as well that that has also borne out uh, over there. Okay. Good. Well, and how does 2021 look? You said that people were having bigger things to worry about, like keeping their jobs. Or are we not looking at the same numbers this year? Yeah. So 2021, of course, we don't really have the statistics for yet. And New South Wales and Victoria are only just coming out of lockdowns with a whole lot of rules in place for businesses and travel. And in Australia, we have a quite unique situation where our internal borders are also closed. So just crossing a state border to get from one state to the other is nigh on impossible unless you're an essential worker or have an exemption. So domestically, from a domestic tourism perspective, we have quite a bit of work to do. On the international tourism front, we're looking to be opening the borders uh, in November and December. Uh, and the, I guess the circumstances of that are still being, um, being bandied about in government circles. 
Yeah. Well, we can only hope that things will start to normalize all around the world, but especially for you guys. You, I think, have had some of the the most rigorous lockdowns in the world, so not yes, fun. Yes, Melbourne has the most unenviable uh, reputation as being the most locked down city in the world now. Go Instead Melbourne. Of the most livable. Yes, yeah. unfortunately. Well, Let's talk, let's change the the tone a little bit and start to think about the positives. So many have said that that tourism in rural areas will rebound even more quickly as people seek to escape the crowded cities, and this might bode well for wine tourism. So, do you believe this prediction? Have you seen any evidence of this trend yet anywhere in the world? Uh, it's definitely what I'm hearing. There's a couple of couple of things around around this particular uh, trend. So in Australia we've found a lot of people definitely fleeing the cities on a permanent basis. So as the work from home trend rolled out last year and into this year, we've seen that uh, millennials in particular have decided, hey, it's not worth living in the central city anymore. We're at the point of uh, young family. We can work from home. Let's go find uh, a bigger, better property that's further out from the city and avoid this, uh, this congestion, this problem that we've had. So regional areas in terms of real estate has really boomed in Australia. In fact, we are, as with many parts of the world, we have a, ma a, a major domestic real estate boom going on right now. And the regions are really benefiting from this. And what that does is it brings in energy and younger people out into our regional towns uh, who want the services that they're used to in the major cities. And this augurs well for many of uh, our regional areas. And that, of course, is where our wine regions are located out in the regions. Uh, we also saw, uh, especially up until the most recent lockdowns and border closures, accommodation in regional areas was impossible to get. Everybody was booked out. So accommodation in especially uh, independent accommodation, Airbnbs, guest houses, those sorts of places, off-grid places, uh, really, really were popular among people. In fact, there's been a, and this is also a worldwide trend, there's a huge boom in tiny houses and uh, properties such as wineries also putting tiny houses and cabins on their properties. So looking for ways to, I guess, diversify and meet the needs of people who are travelling to, to different regions. Uh, the other big trend we're seeing in Australia, and I'm not sure about Europe, I know it happens uh, in, in America, we're seeing a huge increase in uh, motorhome, RV and caravan travel. Yeah. At the moment, if you want a brand new motorhome or caravan, you'll be waiting 12 months to buy one. They are so popular. People have seen this as a way to spend the money that they would otherwise have potentially spent going on a really big overseas holiday. And it uh, means that they are in control of their accommodation and travel as they move around. So again, from a winery perspective, and my hand is up, I bought a motorhome. <laughs> oh, wow. For business purposes, Eric. Totally of course, for business tax purposes. deduction. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. How else to get to wineries and wine regions? Well, it's, it's a lodging uh... expense, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course it is, yes. Um, and it was interesting because one of the, the first things that I discovered when I had a bit of time and decided to head off to a region, and, you know, I, was, I booked... For, for the restaurant and I booked to go to tastings. And then as I drove up, I thought, oh, I wonder if I can get the motorhome up that hill. And if I do, is there somewhere to park? And can I turn around and get back down again? So it, uh, it raised a question for me and an opportunity for wineries to be considering how they can cater for this, uh, this relatively new market out there as well. And when I started speaking to wineries, a lot of them said, yeah, but they don't spend any money. And I said, you can afford a motorhome or a brand new caravan. You have plenty of cash in your back pocket and I'll tell you how it works. They book to go to lunch. They buy up all their wine. They buy up all their produce. They have the lovely lunch and then they head back and park up somewhere by about four o'clock and then they consume it. So definitely uh, uh, no, um, no qualms about spending money. Jonathan, tax benefits of motive home? Of course, it's a tax deduction when I'm heading out to wine regions. What would you expect? <laughs> 
Well, what you've just illustrated is what uh, many wineries and restaurants also experience with the big motor coaches. You know, they can't park them. And how do you uh, unload 56 people to, to come for a visit? And although a motorhome is only going to have probably, you know, two, maybe four people in it at the most, and so it's not going to be the volumes, but, you know, they, they also have more space to, to carry many cases of wine, whereas a, a car trunk or boot might be full. So... <laughs> Oh, believe me, you can always get wine in. I agree with that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's that's interesting that um, you what you were saying. And also, uh, we posted something recently on our GastroTerra community. And of course, I can't find the article now, but it was basically saying how the same phenomenon was happening in the States where a lot of chefs and um, food and beverage makers, whatever, you know, cheese, chocolate, whatever, were getting the hell out of Dodge, getting out of the big cities and moving to rural areas to be closer to agriculture, to have less stress, less strife, get away from riots and unhappy people and the higher prices and the traffic and so on. And then the article, and it was it was from, it was either CNN or um, a really a prominent um, uh, publication, and they were saying that now all of a sudden you're getting great chef food in these small places. Yes. Where, yeah, but, they wouldn't have had it before. That's right. I think there's been a little bit of a trend towards that here. I wouldn't say I've seen it in a big way, uh, but I was reading a very interesting article a couple of days ago. Uh, you may be aware that Australia had some devastating bushfires in the summer of 2020, just before uh, the COVID pandemic uh, hit Australia as well. So kind of a double whammy there. And uh, there was a couple who had moved to an area in northern Victoria, up near the Murray River. And they had uh, planted uh, a little garden, a vegetable garden around the property, uh, mainly zucchinis. And I think you call them zucchinis. We call them zucchinis, but in the UK they are. Um, There's another word. Courgette. Courgette. That's the one. Courgette. Yeah. Yes. And then the the fire hit, and they were all evacuated. And when they went back, uh, their house was gone, and their bus was gone. But the veggie garden with the zucchinis was still there, and so were all the other veggie gardens with zucchinis. They were all still there. Wow. And they were scratching their heads as to why did this occur, and of course. Uh, when they thought it through, it's because of the, the water volume in, in a zucchini. They're, they're very um, water laden, I guess. And they decided that this was actually a type of crop that would be sustainable in good times as well as in bad times. Because if there's anything that the first uh, lockdown, or the, first of all, there was the bushfires, which raised the issue of food security. So in terms of food security in the small country towns, all of a sudden you couldn't get produce, you certainly couldn't get fresh produce and what was there became very expensive. Uh, then of course, with the, on came the first lockdown, the same thing happened, it wasn't just toilet paper that everybody was running away with, it was all the food as well. So the whole idea of food security has come to the fore several times. So this very enterprising community decided to invest in creating community gardens that would not only withstand the ravages of bushfires and potentially droughts, but also times of need when uh, food supply was quite short. So uh, I think there's been some real innovation come out of uh, the circumstances we faced in the last uh, 18 months to two years. I like that smoked zucchini. I mean, you know, can you imagine <laughs> if you could sell those to a restaurant, you could have naturally smoked zucchini on the, on the menu? You could charge Absolutely. more for it. <laughs> a twisted <laughs> mind, I know. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Don't get me started. <laughs> so let's talk. I mean, everyone's talking about climate change, and and of course, you guys are really experiencing that drastically in Australia. So, uh, climate change is causing some grape types to uh, fail in areas that were traditionally good for them, while other areas like the UK and Poland are now producing decent wines because grapes are thriving there in the warmer weather. So, what are some of the new unexpected to destinations that wine lovers can expect to come online this decade? Yeah, I think it's interesting. In terms of the timeline of 10 years, I'm not sure how much new destinations will come on stream. If we look at Australia in terms of cool climate or really cool climate, we're looking mostly towards Tasmania, which uh, a lot of the mainland uh, wineries have realised is the place to be, at least for growing grapes, if mm. not for setting up a shop and cellar doors. So if we take the, the situation of Tasmania, 
uh, obviously being a nice isolated little island, uh, it has the cool climate, it has uh, generally a, a reliable rainfall, and it's well known for producing Rieslings, Pinot Noir and sparkling uh, wines. However, it is also becoming more known for producing some of the reds now. So we can see that there will be a shift towards cool climate uh, uh, Cabernet, Shiraz, but also the other varieties that Australia is really investing heavily in. So it's not always a matter of finding a new climate in which to plant traditional grape varieties. It's looking at the, the regions and the climate and saying, okay, what are some varieties we could grow in this place that do thrive in drier climates around the world? So Australia has uh, increased its plantings of Spanish varieties from some of the drier regions uh, and others from around the world, which are, which are actually taking off and doing quite well. Mm. So our traditional varieties, Shiraz from the Barossa, which you know, is potentially topping out at you know, 14, 15 and 16%, uh, that may have to change in the future. Uh, quite a way down the track, I, I still think. Uh, but there are certainly investments going in in other types of varieties that are perhaps more tolerant to uh, the, the changing of the climate. And of sure. course, anywhere that you do set up shop with, with wineries and if they then invest in cellar doors, you will potentially then get the, uh, the tourism elements uh, popping up as well. Imagine Shiraz from Tasmania or the Queenstown area of New Zealand. That would be very strange. <laughs> they do produce uh, Shiraz, of course, in um, in New Zealand as well. Uh, but and down I think in the we Queenstown probably, area? I'm not sure about Queenstown. Yeah. Uh, I won't predict if anybody on here knows, they can let us know, but I'm not sure about that personally. And Eastern <laughs> Canada has actually been doing quite well with wine production. They always had some, but now they're able to do even more. Well, how are they going with ice wine? Because uh, doesn't that have to, there, there's a ma mandate on to call it white ice wine, it has Correct. to be, the, the temperature has to get to below, is it minus seven or minus nine or something I'm like that? I'm not sure of the exact, but it has to be a certain number of days per per year in order for it yes. to qualify. And typically Ontario and British Columbia were the two big ice wine producers. I think Quebec to some extent as well, but not as, as much volume as the other two. But yeah, I don't, I haven't heard how ice wine is doing in Canada. They might have to move it up to Yukon territory or Northern yeah, Alberta or, now. Or change the, um, the tolerance level of uh, what they'll accept and still call it ice wine. So yeah, yeah I think there certainly are some changes afoot. Uh, I mean, I think it's really interesting when I look at wine tourism around the world and and until this this year and last year, I've uh, been a regular at the International Wine Tourism Conference, which uh, takes place somewhere in Europe about this time. I'm not sure if you're going next week to Portugal, Eric, but if you are, I'm jealous because I would no. really like to be there. No, I'll be in, um, uh, on my way to the States next week. <laughs> Good on you. And, you know, it's it's been really interesting to me to see uh, regions like, and you mentioned a couple of them earlier in Eastern Europe, places like Croatia and Bulgaria and Poland that are, are getting into uh, wine production. And, you know, if we think of some of those areas like Georgia, for example, I mean, they've been doing wine production for 4,000 years. So they are certainly not new at it. What they are new at is wine tourism. So it's the idea of actually people traveling for a wine experience that occurs at its source and wanting to understand what occurs and to meet the people behind the, the production and to meet uh, the people in the area and to marry that whole cultural piece with the food and the provenance uh, as well as the wine. That's probably been the big shift that we've seen. It's not... Uh, you know, if I think of Australia's wine tourism development since, uh, well, since in my lifetime, people would go out to wine regions to pick up lots of booze on the weekends and take it home. That was the reason you went. But with the proliferation of uh, retail wine stores, you no longer needed to do that. So going out to the reason for going out to a wine region has changed dramatically. And so we've seen the rise of what we call experiences and experiential tourism around the wine side. And we've seen a big investment in infrastructure such as restaurants, accommodation on properties, uh, tours, events. Events is a, is a really big area that promotes wine regions and individual wineries. So we've really seen the, uh, the industry uh, mature and diversify. And I think this was probably led by the new world. If I think back to... Uh, early trips around the, in the early 2000s, places like South Africa, 
were well ahead of the game in terms of wine tourism. The rest of us were all really thinking in terms of, hey, we just produce wine that we want to sell. Uh, so it's, it's really changed a lot, I think. And you're probably seeing it quite a bit in England, which, um, you know, that was amazing to me a few years ago to go, really? Wine tourism and wine production in England? Who yeah. knew? Yeah, sparkling wine, champagne, it's its crazy. Mm. Um, there, there has definitely been a shift from wine as a product to wine as an experience. And and that's that's the big thing. But I think that there is a, a, definitely a gap in wine regions becoming wine destinations because like you said they they don't they need the the services they need the food service that goes with it they need lodging and and quality lodging not just a, a cheap little hotel that has been there for 50 years kind of thing you know <laughs> resorts uh, those types of experiences and I, I don't know it seems like in some of the regions i've been to for example in places like eastern europe or and in england as well uh they don't the, the wine tourism experience hasn't been fully fledged out yet. There's still a lot, lot of opportunity for growth. Yes, I think it is an interesting one. Um, when I'm teaching wine tourism, I talk about uh, the difference between being a wine region and being a wine tourism destination because they are different. Uh, Australia has 65 wine regions and not all of them are wine tourism destinations, I can assure you. In order for a region to become a wine tourism destination, it has to, it has to think about the three areas. Uh, the visitor's perspective, what is the reason for them to want to come to this particular destination? Uh, the, the wineries themselves, how do they view their cellar doors? Are they simply, as has been the case in many areas of France forever, just simply as a place to sell wine occasionally if they choose to open? And of course, the community as well. Is it a is it a tourism oriented community? And is there sufficient infrastructure in place to uh, call itself a tourism destination? Because travellers need a lot more than just uh, a, a lovely vineyard to visit. So they need somewhere to stay. They need somewhere else to eat. They need uh, basic services, uh, lots of infrastructure, retail outlets. Shopping is such a big part of any tourism travel experience uh, these days and they need diversity and I think another part that uh, is really starting to come through is the idea of uh, I, won't, I won't call it ecotourism per se but the idea of sustainable travel and people want to be going now to regions that can demonstrate their, their the part that they're also playing in either mitigating climate change preserving the natural environment uh, basically being a, a good corporate citizen for the future. So I think yeah. we're seeing some quite substantial shifts in the way that people want to travel and what's on offer. So perhaps some of the wine regions that currently don't have a lot of infrastructure to support tourists, so what we'd call as being in the early exploration stage of tourism, probably have a lot to offer a specific subset of tourists who really do want to explore uh, things at their, at their rawest and be part of that discovery set rather than going to the mainstream regions that are well known. Wow, that's that's deep. That's a lot. <laughs> there was a lot of information Sorry. in there, Robin. I think I went into lecture mode. Sorry, yeah, students. Yeah, I was thinking, okay, before. here's Robin, the university <laughs> professor speaking. I mean, no, but it's good. It's it, All of that stuff is really good. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I just think about... You know, it, it's such a hard time for businesses right now where you have some businesses closing, uh, whether they're the restaurants that were in the wine industry or I, I, the latest thing now out of the States is the surge in food prices. So mm. one chef in Portland, Oregon, where I used to live, was posting pictures of the cost of things like cooking oil, chicken wings, you know, just normal foodstuffs. And I think... The chicken wings, last year she was paying $40 for a case, and this year it's $178, or the same kind of pricing surge for cooking oil. And, you know, mm -hmm. businesses can't afford to be in business. Uh, I mean, you'd have to triple the prices of things, and a, and a $15 main will end up costing $45 or $50, and no one can afford that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I guess, pardon the pun, on the table here as a, as a discussion to be had. And I know in the UK, food shortages has been a problem for different reasons. Um, and food prices here, I guess in Australia, we're, we're used to prices of food going up and down quite considerably depending on what happens where. So 
we've only just come out of a very long drought period, which has affected various types of agriculture. Uh, every now and again, there's a, a, a cyclone and a big flood and invariable, invariably, these uh, natural disasters also affect our food supply areas. So I guess we're reasonably fortunate that we don't rely too heavily on food imports. We're more of an exporter than an importer. So that's a positive. Probably one of our bigger issues in Australia at the moment in tourism and hospitality is staff shortages. So Australia relies very, very heavily on uh, both uh, international students and uh, international working, working holiday visa uh, and backpackers. So the fact that our international borders have been closed for nearly two years has really impacted our ability to uh, harvest the, the fruit and vegetables at the time that they're ripe. Yeah. And, you know, you'd think there'd be a call to arms for Australians to be able to get out there and do the job instead. But with internal borders closed as well, those opportunities have also been uh, rather slim. So we've faced problems of a different kind here based on you know, different, uh, I guess, macro uh, issues happening. Yeah, well, I've never seen food prices go down. They only ever seem to go up, unfortunately. <laughs> so Too true. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, those wineries that are surviving or even people might be thinking about starting new wineries when this is over, you know, or we're buying a, a failing winery. Uh, what have you seen in terms of wineries incorporating technology to attract visitors? Yeah, look, I think um, one of the things that quite perversely pleased me about uh, the initial lockdowns and, and or restrictions, I guess, that were imposed on uh, cellar doors in particular uh, last year was the, uh, the idea that you couldn't have so many visitors in a cellar door. So we, we had four square metre rules and two square metre rules and all sorts of weird rules. And these changed on a regular basis. And what this did was all the things that I'd been talking about for years that wineries could and should be doing in their cellar doors suddenly had to happen. So you could only consume wine if you were seated. So that got rid of the, the tasting at the bar, which invariably in Australia was free. So if you're going to sit people down and you want to get people, just like in a restaurant, you want to get some table turnover happening, you, can, you need to limit the amount of time that people can stay. If you're going to limit the amount of time that people stay, you probably need to give them a reasonable experience while they're seated yeah. and charge for it. So now we saw wineries that had not considered being in the, what I call the wine tourism experience space, actually creating some simple experiences at first and charging for them. And even better than that, having to take bookings for them because they really needed to know how many people were going to be in the premises at any given time. So the only way to do that was to take bookings. So this opened up the opportunity for wineries to invest in technology, uh, booking reservation systems, creating experiences that could be promoted uh, online and on websites. Uh, on Facebook and take out advertising that way. And we really saw a big growth in that area, which has been sustained. So I, I think that's a, probably a major positive that's uh, come out of uh, some quite adverse circumstances in the last uh, 12 months. And also around engagement. I think one of the things that has really resonated with people is that idea of authenticity, which you and I know very well is, is such an important part of the, the story and the narrative of regions and individual businesses. And people have been telling their stories in a more authentic way. And they've also been connecting by, uh, by video. So video has become a really good storytelling mechanism. I mean, everybody's com comfortable with Zoom these days and wineries uh, and lots of other businesses were got brave and embraced the idea of conducting virtual events and virtual tastings. Now, I won't comment on the quality of some of those, but uh, the good ones were good and the bad ones were not so good, but at least they were, were giving it a go. And there's certainly been uh, evidence to suggest that virtual events are here to stay. They will now be a sim simply a part of the direct consumer sales channel for wineries and a genuine 
part of the, uh, the offering to visitors. And the good thing about it is it's something that can be activated quickly when circumstances change, they can immediately go to uh, back to a virtual uh, event. So in terms of revenue, this has worked well for wineries that, uh, that got on board and did it well. So they would send out a pack to their, uh, whether it was a six pack or a three pack or even a dozen uh, bottles of wine to people in their database and then invite them to participate in a, an online tasting with the winemaker. So that generated sales, it generated engagement, kept everybody uh, uh, feeling like they were still part of the family. And I think those are some of the technical or technological solutions that have really helped the industry in the last two years. Yeah, I think the the pandemic has forced a lot of change. And we always try to look at the positive here at the association. So as tragic as the pandemic was, it it did move things along in other ways to, to the benefit of industry. And so I'm thinking about some of the things I've seen. And um, you know 19 Crimes Winery, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know it's Treasury. a big one in the export to the mm. um, to Europe, but I happen to like the Chardonnay, and I discovered that they have um, the because that all the wine bottles have um, former former criminals, right? The pictures of former criminals mm -hmm. that that moved to Australia on the Convicts. covers. And uh, all you have to do is you get the app and you you pass the the scanner over the front of the bottle, and it, it is the person telling their story. It's really quite clever. Yeah, and it was very, very popular uh, with the millennials and, and Gen Z. There's similar technology for wine labels uh, where same sort of technology is used, pass your phone over the top, and all of a sudden you see the winery dog coming out to greet you and, and talk to you about their owners, <laughs> stuff like that. So yeah. uh, there's been a lot of novelty and a lot of innovation, and I guess uh the success of those initiatives really depends on who the target market is and what it is that they're seeking. Yeah. Well, you were talking before about sustainable and, and we like to say responsible travel. So it's, it's really, it's full circle. It's the consumer as well as the business and it needs to go full, full circle. So when we talk about sustainability, that, to us almost infers that the business needs to be re more responsible and take on some of that uh, more more of the activities, you know, make sure that everything they do is recyclable or biodegradable or whatever. But the consumer can just go on and, you know, keep buying things and throwing things away to their heart's content. But no, it's it's responsible. We, we have to reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse and in order to be part of the solution. So, yeah. um, I would like to open up to a couple of questions now. And if anyone else has any questions, please put them in the Q&A window so we can make sure to answer them in the correct order. So we do have a, one question about an example of a great virtual tasting experience. Do you know of one? Yeah, look, there's there's been a few. Um, there was a There's actually a website set up called Virtual Wine Events, I think. I'll send you the link uh, afterwards, Eric. Uh, that actually curated wine tastings and for the trade as well as for the public uh, around the world. And that uh, was a place that you could go and log on to all sorts of different tastings. In Australia, we had a very successful one run by the National Wine Centre here, uh, where they would, uh, they actually called it the, they worked through every week from A, haven't quite got to Z yet, uh, of the different wine regions of Australia and invited wineries onto a Zoom platform like this and sent out little test tube size bottles of uh, wine to uh, customers. And then customers tuned in and the winery winemakers talked through each of the wines. It was interactive in the sense that uh, a little poll would show up on screen and, uh, uh, and they would... Um, uh, fill in questions, you know, have you tried this type of wine before? What do you think of this wine? And then, of course, there was a mystery wine at the end. So that allowed people to guess what that wine was. And, of course, they put the winemakers on the spot first. And that was always the most fun because winemakers don't always get it right either. So it was uh, terrific for the audience to hear what the winemakers had to say and to go through their process of evaluation and elimination in trying to work out what the wine was. So the interactivity of that was very good. And of course, those wines were then available for sale afterwards. That noise you can hear in the background is my daughter actually opening up a little set of um, National Wine Centre 
test tubes. Oops, very hard to see when you've got this background on. So it comes all nicely packaged so that uh, it doesn't break. And you get this wonderful little test tube size of wine. So this is wine number three. I've got to try and put it in the right spot that you can actually see it. You kind of get the, the gist That there. is incredibly clever. Yeah, so uh, beautiful. Another terrific initiative uh, by a larger event company uh, run by uh, Dan Sims here in Australia is an event called Pino Palooza, which he ran as an in-person event uh, around Australia and uh, in places overseas. And of course, unable to do it in person. So he uh, got the, the Pino, Pinot Noir producers together and they sent out a little 12 pack of little tiny cans of Pinot Noir. And then on the day of the event, everybody logged on to a Zoom environment a bit like this. They had the DJs there. They had the Instagram uh, running up the side and they encouraged people to take photos of themselves enjoying the event and post it with some uh, commentary, which then as you're sitting there participating, listening to the music, hearing the winemakers, trying to drink a 150 ml can of Pinot Noir before they move on to the next one. It was a big day, trust me. <laughs> I, uh, yes, I can tell. A lot <laughs> was asked of you, Robin. <laughs> 12 times 150 mil, but, you know, I gave it a really good go. Um, and it was great because people could then see their photos, their commentary live on screen, and they felt like they were really part of it. Yeah. Another one for people to check out is, um, this is the last one I'll talk about, is uh, uh, Charles Krug in uh, Napa Valley. Uh, Jim Morris is the uh, experience uh, uh, officer there and I participated in one of theirs which was a comedy event. So they took a comedy event online which I thought was uh, pretty novel as well. So there are some terrific examples. I won't talk about the boring ones. <laughs> that, that's amazing. I, that's very, very interesting. And uh, this idea of sending test tubes of wine is actually quite clever because the weight issue is is largely solved. And that was one of the the questions that came up when this this first started. You know, if we're going to be shipping bottles of wine to people, that can get very expensive very fast. And also, when you talk about international borders, it's it's almost prohibitive. You know, with the customs yes. and and also the cost of it. And I think that was that is one problem that has not really been solved in this whole situation and it had kind of been ramping up as well but with people doing more and more ordering online so that whole phenomenon started with amazon but if you think about marketplaces or local sellers as well so i you know put together a food pack from northern spain and i want to send it to you and maybe the food pack is 50 euros but it's going to cost 80 euros to send it somewhere mm -hmm. No one's going to do that. So, so that's that's a uh, that nut hasn't been cracked yet. Ah, uh, look, yes, freight freight is expensive, and it's yeah, it, we can't really solve that one. I was talking to uh, an Australian living in France actually, uh, who has a business where they're packaging up little uh, 50, 50 mil, I think, uh, bottles that can be used for trade tastings as well as for consumer tastings because, of course, the trade side of it's been hit really hard too. Yeah. Wineries would typically be off uh, pounding the pavements of uh, their distributors across the world with their bottles of wine, but they couldn't. So they've helped solve that problem by coming up with small, um, viable, easy-to-send uh, bottles of wine that then the winemaker can talk about... Uh, online so clever. yeah we've had to get pretty clever about uh, how we how we get a quite expensive uh, and heavy product to market in a simple way so we've got a few more questions here the next one is how much do you see locals taking up void left by absent international wine tourists yeah look it's a good question there jonathan um in Australia, of course, we've been hit by the double whammy of not only do we not have international uh, tourists, we don't have the international students and their families, we don't have the, uh, the, the working holiday makers and we don't have the backpackers. So that's a really big problem, not to mention the high value travellers that uh, we typically see from overseas. Um, the locals were very, very busily travelling this country uh, as much as they possibly could in the early days. But in the last 12 months with the border closures, open, closed, open, closed internally, that's really been a problem. 
So if we take Western Australia, for example, that has a region called Margaret River, which is about three hours south. And Western Australia basically shut its borders uh, several months ago, and it is not planning on opening them up anytime soon. So initially, and, and of course, in Western Australia, you've got the, the north, which is um, uh, the tropical area in the summer. So nobody wants to go there. It's too hot. So in the winter, they go up there and then they head south in the, uh, in the summer. Um, people were traveling and spending their money, but of course, there's only so much they can do in one state before they've seen and done most of it. So I'd say we're not picking up the, uh, the void very well at all. And the inability for people in Australia to confidently book travel and have that actually occur has, is a real issue. I mean, we're still seeing customers who have had to rebook flights and accommodation three, four, five, six times. It's getting yeah. to the point where they can't even get a refund anymore. So consumer confidence has really been rocked by that. I'm sure it will pick up again once everything opens, but uh, yeah, it has not been fixed or picked up by the locals. We can't be. I wonder how much, of, how much evidence or how much of an impact this, this idea of, of what, you know, what tourism brings to the economy is making on countries like the United States, which really don't invest much at all in, in tourism, you know, Australia, New Zealand, you guys get tourism really well, and, and you know what it means to lose that tourism. But the the behavior or the, the uh, way it's looked at in the United States is, well, it's business and businesses fail or succeed. And, you know, we're not going to put money into it. We're not going to promote it. You either fail or, or you succeed. That's the end of it. But I'm kind of hoping that maybe governments will start to see and this is this we see this also in latin america too where it's kind of left to its own devices a lot of governments don't put money into tourism promotion and it's kind of um shocking so maybe this will be a, a good um, lesson to those governments that you know hey look at all that revenue that you didn't have coming in that's what we call tourism that you won't fund mm. yeah we do get it in australia but to the extent that it still didn't stop our borders being closed. You know, we, we had no cases in Northern Australia and yet all still closed. So there are tourism businesses that won't recover. I think one of the, the interesting things, and I don't have a crystal ball on this at all, uh, is how the international tourism distribution system has been affected. So when you think about inbound tour operators in countries who of course rely on international tourists for their business, uh, they've had no business whatsoever. So they've really been affected as have the wholesalers because there's nothing to sell to international markets because you can't sell a product that a guest can't get to. Uh, and of course, what we have seen is a rise in direct bookings. So anybody that's booked through some of the, the major OTAs has often been really badly affected by not being able to get a refund when travel circumstances have changed, et cetera. So there's been a real shift to direct bookings. And I think this is where, well, this can only be of benefit to directly to the tour operators and the wineries and the accommodation, et cetera, because they can control their inventory, they can control their number of guests and they can get a full margin for their products. Yeah. So. It's going to be interesting to see how this does play out when borders reopen and international returns. Probably travel agents who have been extraordinarily hard hit during this uh, last two years may actually see an uptick because, uh, again, the confidence factor. If you book through a travel agent, at least you know you've got somebody who will do the work for you because if you sat for 10 hours on the phone trying to get through to Qantas, you probably don't want to do it again. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see the shift in uh, trends and how consumers uh, choose to, to book and take their travel. We have another interesting question here. It says, I'm wondering which aspects you think of the pandemic will change wine tourism permanently? Uh, well, I think one of the things that, um, that I spoke about earlier was uh, the idea of uh, taking bookings, for example, at, uh, at wineries and other tourism operations as well, uh, because we need to potentially know who's coming in the door and where they're from. Taking bookings is a really easy way to 
know all of that information. Plus you've got the bonus of being paid up front. Plus you've got the bonus of uh, uh, legitimately having their data on hand to, uh, to remarket to later. So I think that's, that's one key way that things have changed uh, dramatically. Mm. Okay. There's probably others. <laughs> Um, here's another good question. In terms of sustainability, sustainability, would you recommend visitors use Airbnb in wine regions? In parts of Europe, there's been a movement against this due to lack of affordable housing. Would you say this is the same in Australia? Uh, yeah, Nassima, we've certainly seen um, similar issues here in Australia, and I'm well aware of them overseas for sure. A lot of, not all, but a lot of the uh, B &B, Airbnb operators in Australia are quite small. They are mum and dad businesses and they've found it really difficult uh, and challenging to have to handle the, um, the volume of cancellations uh, as, as borders suddenly shut or flights are cancelled and things like that. So many of them have actually taken uh, their inventory off the shelf altogether and they're just simply renting out their properties. So we're probably losing in some ways, losing some of that inventory because of that factor alone. Uh, and Airbnb, I think, got into a little bit of trouble a while ago with uh, being unwilling to uh, refund all of the fees associated with cancellation. And some of this was in part on Airbnb's side and some of it was of course uh, the choice of the host because they do have a choice so yeah that's that's probably caused a little bit of angst uh, on that side of things uh, we haven't there are places like Byron Bay in Australia which uh, sadly has gone down the Airbnb path quite uh, dramatically to the point where you can walk down a suburban street and there's literally no one there most of the time because uh, they're owned by people who don't live there. And unless there are guests in, there's ac actually no one there at all. So this is affecting local communities uh, from a lot of uh, levels, from the economy through to the social cohesion. So I think we probably haven't seen the full effects that, that you're seeing in some of the places in Europe. And I'm not sure whether we will to the same extent either at this stage. Interesting. We have a, a couple more questions about virtual wine tasting. So the next one is, do you think virtual wine tours, tourism for Australian wineries is also relevant for internationals or just for local visitors who can receive a tasting pack in the mail or visit more easily? Yeah, it's a good question, Susan. Of course, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, you get to taste the product is, of course, the interactive part. I would say that if you're a winery that has uh, uh, exports to a particular country, then you can easily facilitate to have your distributor send those out to uh, customers in the country uh, that you want to have the, the tasting. Failing that, I think it's a matter of um, being really creative and creating something that is uh, a little bit different to the norm. And if I think about the, the Charles Krug comedy night, you know, obviously I didn't have any Charles Krug on hand, shamefully that's uh, but I but I didn't uh, but did I enjoy the the actual comedy event itself and had some other Australian wine on the night yes I did so I think it, it it depends on the type of interaction I mean if you think about how to grow um, or how to engage with your customers uh, that are international that love your wines or have been to Australia and have gone home it's it's really about keeping them in touch with the brand it's uh, keeping them connected so if there are ways to keep that connection going, whether that be through an interview with, uh, with somebody famous or funny or whatever it may be, or you, you bring in a host chef who shows you how to cook, uh, cook, uh, cook up a, a great dish to go with any typical Shiraz, not just the one that you have. Those sorts of things uh, create those connections, uh, generate some income and revenue and keep people in the fold. You know, you said something very insightful that some of the bigger wineries that already have international distributors could put together custom tasting events on a per country basis. So I just thinking about 19 Crimes, uh, which I purchased in the UK. So UK, Australia, you know, easy connection. Mm -hmm. But now I'm living in Spain and I can still get 19 Crimes, but 
that makes me think, okay, with all the competition from the Spanish wines, if I am an Australian winery and I want to keep in touch with my customers in Spain, in Germany, in France, you know, United States, whatever it is, I could do custom tastings, perhaps even partnering with what might be normally competitor wineries, but then we can also do that tasting in language. So it's not necessarily you're doing it in English, but now you're doing it for the Spanish market. We're going to do it in Spanish. It'll be hosted by the Spanish distributor. The Australian winemaker will be there on hand to answer questions, but it's going to, you know, you know, I mean, that's actually a huge opportunity, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. There's uh yeah, we're only limited by our imaginations. Indeed. So, yeah. Okay, I think this will be the last question for uh, the session today. What do you think can be the future of virtual tasting? Uh, I think uh, virtual tastings are probably uh, an important part of a, a D2C strategy for any winery now. And it doesn't have to only be a virtual tasting. I'm thinking about virtual events uh, in total. I think that's a very legitimate form of engagement uh, going forward. So I think they will be here to stay. It doesn't always have to be on Zoom. There are other ways that you can you can do the virtual thing these days. And look, it's even, you know, when we think about technology, it's even adding a chat function to a website. That's an engagement uh, piece. And people have uh, become really used to doing that to get their questions answered so there are ways to engage that uh, can be in the virtual world and they can be around events or tastings or just simply to keep in touch yeah i think the the big lesson here is that <clears throat> all of a sudden the food and beverage industry and tourism industry too learned a way to diversify its product portfolio so you can't sell something that someone can visit in person you do it virtually and we all had to learn pretty much overnight how to do cooking classes online how to do tastings online all of these things that people had done before and sometimes people's internet bandwidth wasn't sufficient or sometimes they didn't have the right kind of camera or they forgot about lighting or sound right so we all became expert studio broadcasters during this huge pandemic <laughs> Oh yeah, my gosh. that's right. We, we've had to become uh, broadcasters. We've had to become used to it. Um, when I was doing webinars before webinars became a, a thing, but I was always really nervous about actually turning the video on. I was like, okay, you can listen to me, but I don't want you to see me. And then, of course, uh, I had to just get over that. And my colleague, Tracy, who I think just jumped on, uh, we had to come up with, you know, how do we make this uh, engaging? And, you know, we did a lot of learning ourselves around how to do that uh, in a way that didn't turn people off because we, we can't see who's out there well, unless they've got their videos on. So, yeah, it, it's, it's been a learning curve for everybody. I think a lot of people did get Zoomed out last year because everybody was Zooming. You know, hey, Zoom, Zoom Vino time, anybody? Um, everybody just wanted to connect that way. And then I think they just needed to stop for a while. But it's still a legitimate way, I think, to, uh, to connect with people and it will be here to stay. Yeah. I, wish I'd, I wish I'd had the uh, um, for, foresight to uh, buy some shares in, in Zoom. <laughs> indeed, indeed, absolutely. And it's almost like in the beginning, it was kind of like, okay, well, this pandemic's going to be over soon. Let's all get on Zoom and have a glass of wine and connect yeah. and have some fun. And then all of a sudden, the pandemic didn't quite end and people started to really get tired of it. And okay, now what we can do. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I think bite sized pieces of information and, uh, you know, nice, fun easy listening types and hopefully this is one of those uh, types of events that people find it's easy to listen to with a glass of wine and I did drink my wine um I know it's a bit early for you although it's after 12 o'clock Eric you oh no I, you know I woke up one morning this week thought you know I need to have a cider right now <laughs> and I thought, that's not a good sign when you wake up and you want to have a hard cider <laughs> nothing wrong with that <laughs> I yeah it's probably uh, some Australian in me somewhere I'm sure I'm sure. <laughs> um, this was going to be the last question, but then there was one more that came in that is really interesting, and that is absolutely going to be the last question. So uh, what is the biggest difference between Spanish wine tourism and Australian wine tourism? Oh, well, given that you live in Spain, um, you'll have to partially answer that question. Um, so Australian Australia is a, a new world wine country, of course. And in terms of wine tourism, we've probably only been doing that very well for the last uh, decade. Before that, we were very much, uh, people had a cellar door, but winemakers regarded it as simply somewhere to 
sell wine for cash. It was it was all production oriented. It's taken quite some time for Australian wineries to grasp the idea of tourism. Now, I haven't been to all wine regions of Spain. I've only been to a few. Certainly, uh, some of the investment I've seen is has been quite extraordinary. So for those that obviously have some money in the wine industry in Spain, they've invested in some incredible infrastructure. Uh, and that's included uh, restaurants, accommodation on site, uh, tours, regional uh, collaborations as well, which I think is another important aspect of wine tourism. It's not just about what you can do at the winery. It's about what you can do to bundle products in a region and collaborate with others to create something that's uh, you know, greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and Spain is an old world country, so it has uh, completely different uh, styles, and it has a different um, it has a different way of consuming wine to the way we do in Australia as well. I mean, tapas are just the most wonderful thing in the world, <laughs> right up there with Italian aperitivo time. So I think there's different ways that wine is consumed and how it forms part of uh, a lifestyle that's that's also a bit different here. What are your thoughts now that you've been living there for a while, uh, Eric? Well, you're absolutely right in everything you said. I think there's a couple things I've noticed. Spain is a very conservative country and doesn't seem to embrace what's new very quickly. So uh, this idea of wine tourism or olive oil tourism is, I mean, there, there are, of course there's wine tourism experiences, but they, they seem to be better in specific regions like Navarre, Rioja are quite good at it. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, even in Valencia uh, in Southeastern Spain, the, the, it's kind of like a state of Valencia, they, they call it a community, but there's some fantastic wineries there, but not all of them are really set up for, for visitation. And I'm currently in Andalusia, which is in the Malaga area, so the southernmost part of Spain, and there's tremendous wine production here, but it's just not talked about. I mean, you you can go to any touristy area where all the tourists would go, and you know where you can book tours and stuff like that. Not a single mention of wine tourism at all, and that is because they're focusing on the sun and sand beaches. You know mm -hmm. that I mean, Spain's coastlines, right, are famous, and so that's what they're trying to focus on. I don't think Spain has really embraced gastronomy tourism in a way that it it could uh, and also a lot of the um a lot of the promotions i'm seeing are only in spanish which are great mm. for the domestic market but don't help anyone unless you're from latin america uh, but they do get quite a few visitors from places like mexico and argentina uh and chile um, brazil as well a lot of those people come here and, and can do well with the spanish uh, language promotions but spain is not doesn't really take the steps it needs to to position itself i think on a successful international scale i mean you look at hunter valley in australia or you look at napa sonoma in the united states or uh you know tuscany in italy these places are world renowned you can come from anywhere speak any language figure out instantly how to get into the wine tourism experience how to find wineries to visit you come to spain not so much. It's much more difficult. And you are absolutely right uh, about the investment in wineries here. There is, uh, I think one thing that Spanish wineries do really well is some of them are architecturally stunning. <laughs> That's a lot of money has been put into them. And, you know, if you can find that, that list of wineries that are really interesting to visit, you'll you'll have a, a wonderful photography experience, if, if nothing more. But uh, speaking Spanish is a huge bonus to being able to enjoy the wine tourism experience here in Spain. And I think um, I think the, the old world countries have something really unique and different to offer, of course. And my last visit, which was uh, to the, the Rioja area, about a specific part of it, I'm just trying to remember what it is. And I remember going to, you know, this tiny little village and it was just incredible to have, uh, to go out to a couple of wineries, but to also be part of this, this little village and village life, which I think is for someone coming from the, the new world and from Australia, that is just something we don't have. And to be able to just walk into a tapas bar at any time and order a carafe of wine and have some fresh tapas was just incredible. Yeah. I think there's another concept that can be explored here, which uh, instead of saying wine tourism, we can talk about wine in tourism. So it's that concept of take the wine to the tourism areas, have a wine experience where the people are, introduce them to 
how the wine fits into the lifestyle that Spanish people love mm -hmm. and get immersed in that kind of uh, aspect of the culture. And then it doesn't always have to take place out in a wine region if there's no infrastructure there to support it. So I think there's other ways that, uh, you know, we can, we can promote and, and enhance the experiences. You are absolutely right. And what you said about wine in tourism is is extremely insightful. I was just speaking with people from Iceland this Nas week. And Nassima, that's right. San Sebastian, that area, that's where I was. <laughs> Basque country, Basque country, yes. Basque, Basque country. Wonderful, wonderful, I'd wonderful remember food that. <laughs> and, and drink region. One of my favorites in the world. But the mm. people from Iceland, they don't call it food tourism. They call it food in tourism which uh -huh. is you know similar to wine and tourism right so so they i think that they're accepting that not everyone in the world is going to be coming to iceland for for the food and drink but once you're there you can experience great food as part of the tourism experience so it's a slight paradigm shift in how you perceive the the overall experience so Absolutely. I think I feel, I feel a little uh, little article coming on about uh, food and wine in tourism. <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm thinking so. Well, Robin, this is, I, I hate to end it. It's been so interesting and it's always fun to talk to you. You're so smart and um, I just love listening to everything you have to say. So thank you so much for taking the time today to share your knowledge with our uh, viewers from around the world. Oh, thanks for being willing to have me on. And uh, thanks to many of my students for also being on tonight. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of them tomorrow. And thanks for the questions, everybody. It's, uh, it's really brilliant to have such uh, really insightful questions to be asked as well. That's what keeps the conversation going. Hopefully get to see many of you soon. Well, thanks again, Robin. And for everyone else, we will see you at the next Food Travel Talk TV. We're taking November off due to a strict travel, travel schedule, but we'll come back again in December and see you for the next Food Travel Talk TV in mid-December. Thank you all.